Ladies and gentlemen, I think we will, I know that everybody's drip, dribbling in and we're very, very conscious that this is the last session, well, you know, second last session before uh, your uh, uh, big uh, final uh, address. So uh, thank you very much indeed. My name is Geraldine Doog. I'm to be your MC for the session, which I'm looking forward to a great deal, the uh, media revolution, myth or reality. And uh, we have a wonderful, really fantastic panel, I think, assembled to take us through the, um, the phenomenon of the post-1990s when the Indian news media threw off the shackles of government control and established this new and vigorous fourth estate. Now, I did notice that um, in The Economist's recent special report on India, it had this particular paragraph, or two paragraphs, actually, if holding leaders accountable for their performance becomes a national habit, it will in part be because of an explosion in television watching. Rajdeep Sadasai, a leading news presenter and editor since the 90s, says India now has 365 round-the-clock satellite channels, as well as many city-based and capable ones. Television helps shape reactions to national issues such as corruption. Mr Hazara's dramatic street campaign and public fasts were made for TV and earned non-stop live cable news coverage. Mr Sardesai, I hope that's correct pronunciation, thinks TV lets voters, quotes, vent anger against the system and judge leaders from close by, but worries that it might lead to, quotes, public hatred of politics. And it just seemed to me when I was reading up for uh, this uh, session that... Um, I just wondered how much the, the news media itself sees as its role and duty to build a constituency for better governance, which I know has been a, a very familiar refrain in this conference, but how much does the media see that as a, an explicit role or not? Because it's not something that uh, necessarily would have been uh, in the... Uh, the duty statement, I suppose, of, of media over time. But that's something that I'm hoping that we can cover. So I'm joining the debate is the State Broadcasting Supremo, Jorhar Sirkar, who is struggling to uh, stem huge losses in India's, at India's version of the ABC, uh, but always considering all the various... Uh, extraordinary questions that surround public broadcasting. I'm going to be very keen to hear how he he actually sees that uh, how he sees that unfolding. Print media. What is its role in this dynamic mix? Indian newspapers have become some of the most profitable in the world. Former diplomat and fellow at the Lowy Institute, Rory Medcalf, and former news editor H.K. Dwar are going to ruminate on India's media machinations. Also, Sunit Tandon is with us, director of the Indian Institute of Mass Communications, which trains the journalists of the future. He'll be reflecting on the types of journalists who might come through. But I'm so delighted to say that to... Lead us off, Nalin Mehta, a Delhi man by birth and training, who worked for about 10 years in the news media, uh, who has now at the University of Singapore, has done a really deep analysis of um, growing political influence on the media in India, and he is going to address us first, and then I'll ask all our other guests to make some comments, and then I will throw it open to the floor in what I think should be a very lively session. So, ladies and gentlemen, please do welcome Nalin Mehta. Uh, thanks very much, Geraldine, for that introduction. Um, my job, as I understand it, is to uh, provide some of the context and the background for the discussion to really kick off. Um, and I can't help but start with the story of a similar seminar done about six years ago by the Australian High Commission with the Hindu in Chennai about the state of the Indian press. And, you know, speaker after speaker got up and talked and lamented about the, the very poor state of the Indian press, the tabloidization, the dumbing down, and so on. These were all luminaries of the Indian press. Until Greg Sheridan of the Australian, who I believe chaired a session this morning, he got up and said, listen guys, all these problems, these terrible problems you are talking about, my proprietors in Australia and proprietors of most newspapers around the world, they would give their right arms to have the kinds of problems that you guys have because we might go out of existence in 10 or 15 years' time. Now, Greg's comment uh, is even more valid today than it was six years ago, and I'll try and uh, tell you why. Now, the... Indian press, of course, has been around for a very long time, uh, since um, James Hickey's Bengal Gazette, uh, which had wonderful advertisements by men who wanted to buy um, uh, slave girls, for example. Um, and now, 
But the reason why the Indian press currently is creating a lot of interest in the global media sphere is because of figures like this one. This is a study done by uh, the Reuters Institute of, of revenues of newspaper industries, uh, major industries around the world. Uh, and look at that. Um, uh, I don't need to tell you in this city what's happening to Fairfax and The Age and how it's been gutted. Uh, but look at the UK, the US. Um, the only, uh, the only uh, country that's not here on this chart is China, and China would be similar to India as well. Um, now, it's because of figures like, uh, now, this is happening because Indian newspaper circulations are now about 160 million newspapers hit the streets every day. It's largely being driven by the Hindi press and the regional press. The black line there is, uh, is the Hindi press. Uh, the red line is the English language press, which is more or less um, is growing, but not as fast. Uh, and if you see the real growth, it started in the, eight, uh, in the, in the uh, late 80s, early 90s, but it's, it, it's since 2000 that it's really shot up. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll park it there, and uh, because Mr. Dua is here, and, uh, and what this growth means, and, 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 whether this, and the discontents of this growth, if you like. We'll talk about that in the discussion. I want to shift very quickly to, oh, by the way, um, this happens this is happening in 11 different scripts, so that gives you an idea of the diversity of this market. Um, let's, uh, quick, uh, let's shift quickly to television. Uh, now, television is very different from print because it was always controlled after independence by the state until very recently. Uh, don't be fooled by that advertisement or for the national program on radio um, because, you know, independent India, it, it inherited a uh, about 14 radio stations, a very advanced, well, not an advanced, but a fairly developed uh, broadcasting setup. It decided not to pursue it. The idea was it's, an, it's a luxury for the affluent. It will have to wait until we, receive, we, we, achieve, uh, we achieve development. Um, and in any case, it was seen to be too dangerous. Uh, now, things start changing. This is a picture of the first news broadcast on Indian television in 1965, an, an interview with Yuri Gagarin. But in 1964, when Nehru dies, there are only 67 TV sets in all of India. Um, so, you know, till the late 70s, and there's not even a national network which is built up. Um, somewhere around the... the and now that tells you the progress of the industry over the last 50 years. Um, the Nehru years, virtually no, uh, no television. Indira Gandhi's time, she starts realizing the importance of television around the emergency in the mid-70s. And it really becomes a national network from the early 80s onwards after the Asian Games, when a national net network is set up. Again, like print, the really big growth happens uh, from the 90s onwards, and the big one after 2000. And that's being driven by cable and satellite. Uh, Mr. J Sarkar will talk about terrestrial, and which is really his domain. But if you look at the, uh, the grid, bar chart there, that's cable and satellite homes. That's almost 70% uh, penetration of the total TV market. Uh, we're talking about 150 million TV sets in the country right now. It's the third largest market in the world, along with China and the US. Um, now, of course, now I won't go into the story of why this uh, changeover happened, why the state monopoly was broken down. That's a, uh, something for later. Uh, but it, it, it happened in spite of the state. Narsimha uh, Rao in 1994, when confronted by the, uh, the, sort of, uh, the, the coming wave of satellite TV, he famously said, it's too dangerous, we can't have these things. But it, but it happened. Um, now, this is where we stand today. More than 800 channels licensed by the Ministry of Information Broadcasting. These are indigenous channels. More than 400 of them do news. Uh, now, of course, the ministry defines a news channel as any channel that even does two minutes of news in a week. So if you look at 24-hour news channels, those are nearly about 200 at the moment in 11 different languages. There are 345 more waiting for permission. So in the next two years, you, this will reach, uh, this will be more than 1,000 uh, networks. Um, so that's, a sort of, that's to sort of set the base of what we are talking about. Now, this again tells you how the channels have grown in the last 10 years. Again, there's been a real expansion, basically from 2000 onwards. Satellite TV comes in the early 90s, but it really explodes from, the, from, from 2000 onwards, 821 now. Um, this, along with the growth and along with the expansion of, of uh, penetration of, of television reach, you're also seeing an expansion of advertising revenues. 15 to 17 percent average growth rates in the television industry as a whole. Uh, but this chart is a little misleading, and I'll come to, and that's what I'm going to talk about primarily today. That as an industry is really expanding, uh, the industry is making profits of 15, 17 percent over the last 10 years continuously, and and the people who look at this are saying this will, this will continue for the next 10 years. But does that really mean? That, but channels basically don't make money in India, and I'll come to to why. Uh, again, this is the diversity. Right now, television 50 percent of the market is Hindi, 10 percent English, the rest of it is all regional. 
and that's the regional diversity we're talking about. This, is, uh, this regional diversity, just like print, has also uh, uh, so far been, has so far relatively protected the industry from consolidation. Uh, of the big players coming in because it's very complicated to work in different markets. Uh, that's changing now, but so far that's been the trend. I'll come to that as we go along. Um, this is this, uh, about five major broadcasters control about 61% of the TV market in the country. Uh, but if you look at their, their, their individual shares, it's not very high uh, compared to global standards. Um, Star TV, which is Murdoch, 19%. Z, which is Indigenous, 14 Sony, 12 Viacom, 6 um, and why I'm saying is not very much, if you compare to the United States, for instance, the top five control 70%, the top six control 85%. The same with, uh, in the UK, the top five control 85%. In Brazil, it's about, it's about 80%. So if you compare to other countries, uh, this, is a, this is by far the most diverse market among the major television markets of the world, even though 61% looks quite, looks quite big. Um, right. I now want to focus a little bit on news television in particular, uh, and that's specifically for this discussion. Um, like I said, uh, half of the 800 channels are news channels, but you see, the, but that's quite an anomaly because news as a money-making market is only 10% of revenues come to news out of, out, out of the entire television business. Yet half the channels w work only on news. Um, why is that so? No channel makes money. They're only out of the 400 channels only about. Four or five, I've said two or three there, that's wrong. About four or five make money at the moment. Uh, everybody else is, is, is in the business of making losses. If you put your money in a bank, in a fixed deposit in India, you would make far more money than if you would invest in a news channel. So why are these channels being launched? That picture there is of a politician from Tamil Nadu uh, who launched his political career by launching Captain TV. Um, and that's what's happening right now across regional markets. One third of news channels are owned either by po politicians or their proxies or real estate companies, which are extremely dubious because they, uh, they're all aligned with, uh, you know, land is a really big issue in India, which people here would know about. Uh, um, uh, um, they, they use the channels for, for various kinds of influence or by dubious financiers. In July 2012 alone, Serious fraud cases were filed against the promoters and CEOs of four different uh, TV channels, and fraud cases to the tune of millions of dollars were forging documents and things like that. So there is a serious crisis in the industry right now, and that we cannot understand that without understanding who runs this industry. The serious media players are not making money, and the guys who are getting in are, are the people who are in the business for something else. Um, if you look at markets like Odisha, for example, uh, in the east, there are five channels there. Each of them is owned by a politician. In Andhra, 20 channels, 19 owned by politicians. Uh, in Tamil Nadu, Tamil Nadu is the most obvious example. It's always been controlled by, uh, by politicians. If you, uh, and it's not just the ownership of the channels themselves. It's also the ownership of the distribution mechanisms. Because in India, um, uh, uh, because of its illegal origins as an industry, and I'll talk about that later, channels do not control uh, they do not have access to who actually watches them. They can't tell you, they don't control the distribution chain, and that's done by cable operators. In a state like Punjab, the Akali Dal controls the entire cable operator, uh, operator's network. What that means is that if you, even if you're, an, if you're a channel with nothing to do with Punjab, if you're a national channel, and you broadcast a story about Punjab, you will get blanked out on the, uh, on the TV screens while that story is running. Um, and, and, this, and this is not the Akali Dal. Uh, the, before the Akali Dal came to power, the Congress used to do that. And the Congress cable network was shut down within two hours of Mr. Badal being sworn in as chief minister 10 years ago in his first term. It's never been revived. And the Akali Dal basically took over. It's the classic takeover of power. The same thing happened in Chhattisgarh. Uh, when Ajit Jogi was the, was the chief minister about five or six years ago. And the BJP took over those, those channels of communication. All right, uh, let's park that thought there. Second, uh, the very important point along with, with who runs the channels is that there's a big consolidation happening now. Reliance, Mr. Mukesh Ambani has just bought over 51% stake in the largest regional television network, Inadu, and also in the uh, TV18 network, which runs the CNN affiliate and the CNBC affiliate in India. So they basically control all, all of news. Now, Reliance, for example, is not investing in entertainment television in such a big way as it's investing in news. And Reliance is not the only one. The Oswal Group has recently bought stakes in NDTV. Um, the Aditya Birla Group has bought stakes in, 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 in India today. There is, there, because the, the channels don't make money, even though the market is, is expanding, they're looking for other sources of revenue, and the corporates are moving in. So you combine the dubious financiers, the politicians, and the big corporates, and you see what's happening with the, with the larger economy of this business right now. Um, now, now, this is a grab from a new story that was done about two or three years ago. Uh, for those of you who don't know Hindi, it says, do aliens drink cow milk? 
and they did a two hour show on this. It's not just a story, it's a two hour show. And the top line on the banner says, the one in red says, this cow could be yours too. Uh, so that's the kind of news that a lot of channels are doing, uh, including some of the serious players, because they just don't make money. And the only way they can do it is this. I'm not justifying this at all. Um, the problem is, and there is a structural problem here, apart from talent and apart from what you want to do with the news channel, is that around the world, if you look at the economics of a television channel, they make about 70, 80% from, from, from subscription revenues, 20 to 30% from advertising. In India, it's exactly the reverse. You are dependent on 70 to 80% on advertising and 20 to 30% on subscriptions. And many of the news channels are free, so they're dependent entirely on advertising. And that's because when television came in the 90s as a private uh, enterprise, uh, it was illegal, uh, at least till the mid 90s. Uh, and, and there were serious problems in putting the distribution chains in place. So the cable operators came into existence, and we can talk about that later. Um, and they control the access. So what happens is that they, they don't, uh, uh, so the channels can't, you know, most of the subscription revenue, 80, 90% is left with the cable operator who's the distributor. The channels don't get anything back. So the, how do they make money? How do they survive? Um, th therefore, you're dependent far more on ratings, and, which are very dubious. And Mr. Sarkar has, has gone to court against the rating system. So we can talk about that later. Um, but more than that, there is also a serious problem of talent. Um, uh, and I think this is something that a lot of the channels which actually do make money are struggling with. Um, if you, uh, um, uh, if you look, and this is not just for news television, this is for entertainment television as well. If you look at a channel like uh, Star TV, and I've been doing some research on this in the last six months, if you look at the major broadcasters and see who makes their programs, um, I'm talking about soap operas here, for example, not just news, you will see that there will basically be a bunch of 10, 11, 12 writers who write all the shows across all the languages. Um, there is a serious structural problem of getting, now it's a chicken and egg situation. Are they, uh, are they not getting the right talent or is the talent, is, or is the talent uh, facing a situation like the Congress party where if you want a ticket, you need to know, you need to know the right person to get in. You know, you can't, uh, is, there's no system of, of getting the right talent in. And so Mr. Tandon is talking about uh, uh, the IMC being turning into a university to solve these kinds of issues. We can talk about that later. Uh, this is Uday Shankar. He's the head of the largest TV network in the country, Star TV. Um, and this is something that he's been talking about a great deal. Uh, a, a lot of the serious people in the business understand this, I think. Um, how much time do I have left? Oh, it's just under three. But okay. Uh, there's another problem of regulation, which is that uh, in 1995, the Supreme Court of India um, um, deregulated television. And because it's India, it did so because of cricket. Uh, which was that there was a Hero Cup, uh, which was a cricket tournament being held in India. Uh, the satellite television revolution had become a reality, but it was still not being legalized. And what was happening was that Doodarshan, which is the state broadcaster, wanted to broadcast Hero Cup, and the rights were with Star TV. So they basically arrested the executives of Star TV and, and said, this is illegal, you can't broadcast from India. So, so, the, so various people went to court, including Star TV and the, cricket, the Board of Control for Cricket in India. And that led to this judgment in 95, where the Supreme Court said, the airwaves are the property of the public as opposed to the property of the government. And therefore, bring in a law to regulate all this entire thing. Now, that law has still not been brought in. It's, uh, it's you know, it's what, uh, 12, 17 years since. What they brought in in 95 was a law that only legalized the business of distributing television. Uh, so therefore, they legalized the cable operators. But the television guys were still, you know, the uplinking, downlinking guidelines, they all came much later, later in 2000. What we have now is we have lots of regulations and, and a system has been put, put in place with various institutions. But what we still don't have is an overarching broadcasting law which brings in regulations about content, for example, about cross-media ownership for various issues which, which matter. You know, there is still no independent regulator uh, like the Ofcom in the UK or the FCC in the US or, 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 or like the one in Australia, which can look at the entire business independently and, and be the one point stop for various things. Now, of course, content regulation and so on is a very uh, con controversial thing, so we'll talk, I'll leave that for the moment. Uh, this is a sort of rundown of the laws and the regulations that have been passed. In almost every case, um, I don't have time to go through each of these, but basically every time, every government in 95 has tried to bring in some kind of legislation, and every government has had to backtrack. Primarily because of political opposition, because they have vested interests among the existing players, because of interest by the domestic industry, various things. Uh, the only exception to that is uh, was initially the law which uh, ma made it mandatory to uh, make cricket broadcasts on public broadcasting. So, you, so if you get a license to broadcast a cricket match, you have to give it to the public broadcaster, no matter how much you pay for it. And for that, there was unanimity in Parliament. That was in 2005. Um, 
Again, just like the Supreme Court in 95, the Parliament in 2005. And the second exception to that is the last one, which is very significant, which, which makes it compulsory to bring in digitization. And that, I think, is, is going to improve the business model of television in a great way. It's a very revolutionary move. And that's finally been brought in with some unanimity. But again, it's not the kind of overarching framework that, that you need. It, it sort of talks about content, it talks about distribution and things like that. Okay, my, I'm, I'm going to conclude with the final point, that this kind of growth is... We have not reached the end point of this. You know, compared to other countries, we are still 61% penetration in television. In, in, in newspapers, 165 million circulation, you know, give or take a few with the, with the, if you dispute the figures. There's still a very large, you, you are nowhere near even 70-80% of, of the entire market. So this will grow for a long time. And not to forget the fact about there are now some 600 million mobile phones in the country. Um, and the internet penetration is beginning to start increasing. Um, uh, along with cable distribution, the, the Digitization Act, broadband penetration is expected to increase on the back of, of cable operators. So we are going to see a big change. Um, again, you know, I think the Indian industry, part of the problem is that it's drunk with volumes, that we are the largest newspapers in the world, largest television channels in the world, world largest film industry in the world. But only, only people in India talk about it. It is not talked about elsewhere. So it's world famous, but only in India. Um, the, uh, and the reason for that is that even though the numbers are so huge, the money you can make from those numbers, from the point of view of somebody who runs this, is very small. So 10 years ago, if you were a Rupert Murdoch, India would have been, um, it wouldn't, you know, you wanted to be there, but it wouldn't really have mattered. Now it's nice to have, but it's, but it doesn't, it's not essential to have, it's not yet anyway. Uh, it's, it's essential to have because of its potential for growth in terms of the money you can make. But in real terms, the money you're making, it's, uh, you're sort of 14th in the, in the uh, largest media industries of the world. Uh, part of that is, uh, uh, is because advertising revenues in India uh, are still very low as a part of GDP compared, uh, um, forget about the US and UK, even Brazil, 0.6% of the GDP goes to advertising in India is still low. So there is a lot of, this is what media entrepreneurs are now talking about. This is the, uh, that, you know, how do you monetize it? How do you monetize these volumes and therefore make it commercially viable uh, for many people? Um, I'm going to conclude with this last thing. An average Indian today spends, this is research from PricewaterhouseCoopers and CII, uh, spends $7, 7 US dollars a year on all media and entertainment products, from newspapers to television to films. Uh, the average in Brazil, in Brazil spends 65 US dollars. So what I'm saying is that not only is the penetration... Uh, nowhere near it. Uh, there's, there's still a lot of leeway for the growth to grow, but also about the money you can make from it. So we're going to hear much more about this in the next five or six years. Thank you. Well, thank you, Nalim, very much indeed. It's always a great risk when people present like this that you end up speaking just as quickly <laughs> as uh, no, I'll attempt not to. It's one of the great lessons you told when you're interviewer. Do not... I was trying to keep it down to... Less. <laughs> Well, you did a very... I, I warned him. He wanted 20. Actually, you did get 20. I said, make it 15, and we, we settled on 18, but I think he, he did very well indeed. And, of course, we know all about something being world-famous only in Australia because that's our football league, you see. We think our, <laughs> our AFL is absolutely, you know, the last word in football, but it's mainly in Australia. Uh, now, I'm, my, I'm greatly delighted to be uh, welcoming, in fact, our next speaker, who is uh, Mr... Do I? Yes, um, because he has a very 40 years, in fact, uh, working in the industry in India and all sorts of editorships and a, a man of considerable authority. And I do, I'm going to be very keen indeed to hear how you respond. And I've allowed 12 minutes for your response. So I do welcome you. Thank you for being generous. From 15, it has been cut to 12. <laughs> Well, interestingly, the subject for this session is media revolution, myth and reality. It's very familiar to me. I was working in the Indian Express in my growing up, when I was growing up as a journalist. The proprietor of the Indian Express was a brave fighter, but could be, would, would pick up fights selectively, though. Ramnath Goenka. Most Indians know. Foreigners won't know. There are people from here would not know. We had an outstanding editor, Frank Morais. When politics was hot in the early 70s, 
he used to write a daily column, Myth and Reality. So this title reminded me of that column. Another outstanding editor was Chalapati Rao, a different ideological bent of mind. He wrote a column to say, Myth is Frank Morris, Reality is Ramnath Goenka. But there was some sense of humor prevailing at that time in country's uh, argumentation at that time. Mr. Frank Morris picks up the phone in the morning after he reads Chalapati Rao's comment on him and says, <coughs> MC, you're a <coughs> MC, you're the fast one on me. Come have a drink. These days, you can't crack a joke in politics or an ideological debate. We have been to two and a half days debating argumentative Indian. <coughs> and we have analyzed the anatomy of democracy quite a bit. Now it has a relationship, media also has a relationship with that. And the kind of size of the explosion TV, which Nalin has, he has been more bothered about the business matter, which is very important for uh, most business owners, but he has also referred to concentration of the media in a few hands. Imagine this kind of power is exercised by a few hands, money people. How much denial it can do, how much it can deny the public issues being debated for the people and by the people. Already we are seeing in the television debate I'm not going to talk much on the television as such. Learning from politics, we, democracy is run by parliament, judiciary, executive, executive supposed to be responsive, and it has been accused of being unresponsive. Parliament is said to be very representative, and people are developing doubts about its capacity to represent, and those doubt, doubts are on the street. Judiciary, people are feeling dissolution with because your case cannot be heard for 20 odd years. So they turn to media. So they have faith in the media. The credibility is still there. But imagine already media is facing a problem of losing credibility. The days of persuasive argumentation in a democracy, certainly in the last 65 years, have been replaced by noise, and the media has joined the noisy party now. Those are the kinds of, and if the kind of the size which television is going to ex lead up to, and in the wrong hands at times, what impact it can have on its impact on the democracy's future? I think that's something all of us need to bother about it. We have a rich tradition of Indian media. Its role in, its product of renaissance. <coughs> its career, Indian journalism's career, grew with freedom struggle. It shared some of its ideals. Before, the meet, before freedom, it had two aims, most of the press. And people suffered for those aims. The great leaders like Tilak, Mahatma Gandhi, they, had, they used the gen journalism, they used media for sending out their message for freedom. They also sent another message of social reform. Now, that kind of legacy helped in drafting the Constitution, the kind of Constitution which has been analyzed from a liberal point of view, and whether it how, for how much it has helped in governance of the country in the last 65 years, how standards have got deteriorated, and why the message of the Constitution has not reached Chhattisgarh as Nandini Sundar has described. Many points have been analyzed. But at that time, the media supported the kind of constitution which was product of freedom struggle, Gandhi's ideas, 
Ambedkar ideas, Jawaharlal Nehru's ideas of parliamentary democracy, how do you translate it? And media shared those. There was not much argumentation on those aims when adult franchise was discussed, social benefits were discussed, and passed. There was some debate, but healthy debate. These days, the debates are ruckus, and television helps that, helps that kind of noisy debate with persuasive argument and reasoned debate is out of, out of getting out of, certainly out, it has got out of the TV and getting out of the print media also. After independence, the message of the freedom was given a push, the political message, the social reform media forgot about it. Nobody in the media now, whether in print media or the television, is raising voice against caste system as such. On the contrary, the trends are otherwise. Nobody in the media is talking against superstition and some of the channels are glorifying. Nobody in the media is, some of the channels are glorifying crime. Now, the social part of the, the role which media can perform in a country of India's size, where 30 crore people are poor, out of reach of uh, the progressive schemes, for various reasons, which have been analyzed, so I won't go on that. Media had a role to take the message of social reform, but that has been forgotten. No, I'll take five. Be as generous to me, little, little less. <laughs> now, that is, that is missing. But my worry is different. For media to do its role, it also has to be independent. There's a reference to emergency in the beginning. Constitution guarantees 191A full freedom. So I'm cutting it short to the bare points. In emergency, this media was overnight, electricity was switched off, printing presses were sealed, censorship was imposed. Now, that was the practice during British Raj earlier. Luckily, it was lifted after 21 months. Next came the defamation bill in 80s. That was an assault, sort of, sort of an assault. By this time, media had become wiser, which it was not. The emergency took it by surprise by most of the press, not all. They fought the defamation bill, which was supposed to stop exposures at that time at highest level. It led to a big movement, a united press. After that, I don't think the press will give up its freedom. But the question is, who exercised their freedom? I'm worried about that. Is it the journalist? Is it the editor who is exercising going to the field or the proprietor? And if the proprietor has different aim to fight election for himself, if the proprietor has to run his business empire and acquire channel rights or newspaper rights, many, many proprietors are getting into the print media, many have got into the TV, many are getting into both. So this concentration of power, media power, and media claims power equal to now with parliament. We are claiming. Not that they have that power. But concentration of power in a few hands is a danger. I think we need to, we need to think about it, how to do it. Under the Constitution, freedom cannot be taken away. But this ownership of the print media, as well as the television, I think, till that is democratized, this will press freedom is in danger in India. Maybe it's elsewhere also it could be in danger, wherever it is. The press freedom will be a myth and the reality will be the owner's freedom. Many of the newspapers in India have done away with the institution of editor. There are no editors. Proprietors are the editors. Editors are supposed to face when there is a, in the registration notice they give at the end of the pages, it's written, content has been selected by 
by the executive editor or some, some designation they will give. So when defamation suit is there, the editor has to appear before the court, the pr proprietor of the paper who wants to use the paper for his business or political ends would like to protect himself and sacrifice the editor. Or supposing the government pressure comes. The pressure on the journalists, journalists often say no. But when it comes to the proprietor, then there is a problem. And proprietors would like to oblige the government of the day. Government also would like to oblige the proprietors who are helpful. There's always a quid pro quo when there is no free lunch. Now, nexus between the government and the major proprietors, again, will be a problem for media to play a role in a democracy. There are more points which one can discuss with you, and maybe in coming question answer later on, because I can see a little unease on, on, on the back here. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dura. I'm sorry, and that's a pretty powerful statement. The media has joined the party of the noisy party. Very strong uh, statement, and but that that just that small coverage of history is really, I think, very timely. Now, I wonder how the public broadcaster sees this. Joha Serka is uh, presently Chief Executive Officer of Prasa Bharati, the Broadcasting Corporation of India that supervises the two national broadcasting networks of India, All India Radio and Dordoshan, uh, and, as Nalim re referred to, a man used to uh, the politics, used to uh, politics and the media, but uh, a zeal for education, culture, anthropology, as he told me during the break, and handcrafts and handlooms. So I'm very much looking forward to hearing what Joha has to say about this media revolution myth or reality. Thank you, Geraldine. Uh, my thanks to the chairman of the Australia India Institute and to Amitabh Mattu. He has chosen four ex-civil servants, the ex make it better, uh, for the discussion, two of them went on to become governors. One, the fiery lady you heard yesterday, is sure to become a cabinet minister very soon, and let's see where the fourth goes. Now, uh, since Nalin and I haven't spoken at all on this subject, but we tend to agree on most uh, statistics, most trends, so I'll quickly skip past the statistical part Wherever we agree, you can take that as a truth. Wherever we disagree, you can take my version. <laughs> now, hmm. so, psh, comes with a lot of noise. Anyway, these are the bare statistics. Where I wanted to focus is the media as a whole. Instead of taking it print and the TV, there are other components as well. We have 82,000, 14 billion to 15 billion is the size of the industry. When he says that's pretty low, you've got to take purchasing power parity and other factors in. Number of TV households, radio households incidentally are quite a lot. It's 50 million here, but another 80 million on FM. FM channels, film industry size for its influence is woefully inadequate. For the influence that uh, the film industry uh, has in India, wow. Who's put in? Uh, these are all statistics. The one that's more important is that <laughs> TV controls. TV, TV, TV has an annual growth rate of 11%, going up to CAJR of 17%. So that is where the future lies. Next is print. That's 9% growth, which defies most, uh, which defies most uh, international trends. And the total is 15% growth for the media. Move on. The next part is on circulation, which we can practically skip, media circulation. The ones, this is interesting in terms of numbers, though, as Nalin said, the numbers really don't uh, matter. In fact, if you take the absolute number of the largest Hindi daily, it's more than the population of three countries put together. I mean, it's, that, that's way. The growth, the last point is the most important. Growth is defying the international decline trend or trend of decline. If there's a, we agree on that point. Now, on the print media, uh, you can see 
the global print subscription is uh, declining. He has shown it more emphatically. I don't know, it's a bit uh, skewed, but never mind. It's more or less the same point. The US uh, market, that's a digital media coming up, that bottom line. That is a guy to watch. Print media, they've botched up the statistics here, but the fact is that advertising does matter in India. TV channels, 831, he said the same thing. We'll come to the conclusion part, which is more important. Subscription revenue and advertising revenue, we'll come to this again. Films, this is just for statistics, we'll get it with you. The interesting part is the unifier of India has been the Hindi films, which had about 25% share. It set the the cultural base of modern India. It's coming down. That is something, a bit of a worry. Uh, film revenues are stagnating around 1.8, as I said, but is likely to go up to 2.9 in the next five years. Radio incidentally staging a comeback. We, in fact, signed a deal with the ABC yesterday because they do well on the radio. I went out, slipped out, and signed it. <laughs> radio, <laughs> radio. Now let's come to the part, what matters. Whether it's a success, where it's made an impact, is it a myth, is it a gas balloon, has it actually penetrated, does it affect? Well, it strengthened the democratic discourse in India. There's no doubt about it. No doubt about it. At the grassroots level, remember, we have 760 million voters. Someone has to reach to them, and that's what the media has done. There's no doubt it's been open, fearless, critical. As someone was saying last night about when, when Shankar Ayer went on about his version of India, we said that because this is Australia and India, he got away with it. In some other countries, they would have taken a silence and shot him down. It's been able to ward off censorship. There have been quite a few battles, and they have won. When we come to open, fearless, and critical, often this open, fearless has often been coterminous with business interests, but we let that pass. Forced government's attention on issues, there is no doubt about it. But let's not exaggerate beyond a point. The first 25 years, parliament was watchdog. As anyone knows, anyone who studied Indian history knows, it was Faroz Gandhi, the husband of Mrs. Indira Gandhi, who was, who was some sort of veteran of the government, it was the Public Account Committee, it, the Sahu Jain case, the Mundra case, one after the other, Telco case. These were the ones that skeletons that came out, and this was done not by the media. It was done by Parliament. That's one part. On the print media success, from the 80s onwards, the print media took off, where Parliament sort of flattened out. Uh, I've just mentioned a lot of number of cases. It's, it's a part of the myth, part of the reality of India. That was all about the print media. Just for a moment, we focus our attention on radio. Radio from a tool of the empire, it became the, the adhesive that was in unity of India. The Brits left behind, British left behind 18 transmitters in 1947. There are four, over 400 now. 23 Indian languages, 146 dialects. The matrix of India is much more complicated than what one would like to simplify. Let's take a small state like Manipur, 2.7 million population. So we have, we're not talking numbers, we're talking complexities. We have to broadcast in one language called Manipuri, six major dialects, whatever that means, and 23 minor dialects. That is how the tectonic plates of India are balanced. And that is a bit that the public service broadcaster do, has to do, and no one else could. Vivid Bharati forged in the unity that became the, the, the common memory of India in its growing years. The FM revolution revived the radio. The community radio has not been much of a success. So let's move on from print radio to the TV. Here I'm referring to Dudashan. The early 20 years were almost a state monopoly between 80 and 2000. I've mentioned a few, few success stories, Ramayan, Mahabharat, Hamlo, Kuniyad, Chitrahar, I mean, many others can go on adding to this list. This, these would be the building blocks of India getting together. As somebody had explained in the morning, India's diversity is between, let's say, a Scots, as a person from Scotland and Poland working together. 
It's diverse, and this diversity has been held together through certain memories, mechanisms, and networks. Impacts and spin-offs. Cultural unity, that's one. Uh, as I said, songs, especially the Hindi variety, songs, memories, films, mixed food, dress, cricket, all of this got India together, and there in this cultural unity, the radio and television, state-owned at that time, did play a big role. Essential information was passed on. This was essential information and education, public education was carried on. Globalization and lifestyle actually came not through advertisement, but came in more through this, both through the, uh, the, the, the print and the radio and television. So much so that now it's no more. The choices are between haves and must-haves. Hindu consciousness, this is one sensitive idea about which we don't discuss much in public. Maybe the epics and the religious themes had a role to play. I leave it that to academics to discuss. Social activism would also be spurred on these medium. Rajini, Ye Jo Hai Zindagi, Ulta Pulta. These were all shows that, that mimicked society, mimicked the mimicked government, mercilessly attacked the government on the state media. The next part of the success belongs to the private satellite channels. From 2000 onwards, it's a private satellite channel. When it was demonopolized, I was converted to one more player. Uh, this is the stage where... Now, the trends that one observes is that the general entertainment channel, people's spent popular entertainment becomes the base. At any cost, popular entertainment, reality shows, soaps and serials, competitions, uh, songs and films, popular entertainment becomes partly standardized. I call it Bolly Pact. There's a Bollywood element, the, the Hindi film element that comes into almost everything. News becomes competitive sensationalism. One after the other, Telkas, 2G Spectrum, other Society. It's competition. Bloodthirsty, trial by media. Uh, before I mis misunderstood, let me clarify that every time I see a corrupt civil servant go to jail, my heart leaps with joy. At least you have done something that we couldn't do. But that's not it. But trial by media has been taking it too far because there's no jury. It's only a one way. Yeah, I'm the judge, I'm the jury. I shall condemn you with all my fury. Heads off. Heads must roll. The next part is the profit, loss, and corporate. This Nalin had also touched. All Major news channels are making losses. Three have marginal profits to show. I have all the accounts with me. All of them are making losses, yet sustaining mission or mystery. I leave it at that. I'm supposed to be within certain limits. Nalin has already given you strong hints. Mergers and acquisitions are taking place. He had mentioned, so we can go on, CNN, IBM, tying up with the Ambani's. Times of India and other groups penetrating every domain possible. The India Today group. Then comes Barons controlling, controlling content and distribution. Again, he had mentioned this. I'm re-emphasizing Z is one example of content and distribution. So are co colossal corporates replacing giant governments? Was all this in vain? That's something to ponder about. Are we now going to move on from giant governments to equally brutal, brutally big corporates? Citizens need the space and voice. The worrisome trends are no regulatory mechanism. As he had said, we welcome a regulatory mechanism because we are now part of the same playing field. Uh, TV ratings have a monopoly. There's only one TV rating company that's controlled by a multinat that multinet had, has, has had to leave certain countries because of their practices. We, its matter is sub I can't say much more. 8,000 people meters for 1.2 billion people, and that also we don't know where they are. And then they go on rating X is Y, X is great, Y is great, etc. cetera. Uh, media baron, political nexus, many are MPs. He has also pointed out. So here we tend to agree, paid news and blackmail. The Election Commission, the mm, Press Council of India, the National Broadcast, Broadcast uh, Services um, Standards Authority, 
and citizens, all of us are worried. Major issues and failures. The major issues of India have been discussed threadbare. These are hardly ever projected. With poverty, poverty in India is a, it's a bit of a rubber band. You can take it down to 37%, take it down to 29%, depends on which yardstick you take. Disparity, 55 billionaires control 11% of India's GDP. Whereas 500, it needs 500 to control 10, 11% of the GDP of the USA. That's where disparity comes in. This is hardly ever mentioned. Rural issues are viewed with urban eyes. Somebody mentioned the superstitions, emphasis on sex, crime thrills. The common man, I repeat, is squeezed between the business and babudam. Babudam is a word that we use for the bureaucracy. Uh, my last few slides. The issues are civil society and transparency. The civil society and transparency movement in India goes back to about 50, 60 years. It was led by social activism, people's movements like the Chipko movement, right to information. Some, uh, yesterday we had a lot about it. Consumer awareness movement, judicial activism, citizens' uh, charter bill, blog space and netizens. They can't be ignored after Tehri Square, WikiLeaks. Procurement mandatorily on the web. I have not mentioned the Comptroller and Auditor General. That control, that is a total transparency space in India. Now, that space, the press is the interlocutor. Media is the interlocutor. It's a beneficiary and a catalyst. It's more like a ladle that stirs it. It can't claim to be both the pot and the broth. That's my humble submission. It does stir it, but at times it appropriates to itself the, the area of both the pot and the broth. It cannot appropriate all the credit. It's just a ladle. The last trend that I can see is about the international trend that we see, we are all moving fast to digitalization. Print is digitalizing super fast. 950 mobile sets in India going on to 1 billion. Smartphones are growing. Tablets in India, tablet prices in India have come down to below $100, US dollars. Fixed TVs and fixed PCs are on their way out or are being relegated to the weekend practices, weekend. It's going to be mobile, you mobiles, and I keep insisting, we, our analysis is that the media would now have to run after their customers, streaming IPTV, social media, webcast, that's the future. The, worry, the only worrisome trend about this future is that it's not led by subscription revenue. It's led only by advertising revenue. How do we tackle that paradigm? That's the thing that we have to worry about. Bandwidth is a problem, but we have two national network projects on, on, on the ground now. National Knowledge Network, National Optic Fiber Network. Kerala has shown the way with, by providing one GB at $3 per month in 60,000 villages. That is where the future lies. Who pays, who benefits? As I said in the beginning, Advertising revenues will take over. What the implications are for the advertising revenue, does it, uh, does it reinforce plutocracy? I don't know. I can't see that far. Digital revenue is always based on ads, not on fees and subscriptions. Digital democracy means ruthless competition. Thank you very much. hard for humble Australians to uh, take all that in, I must say. That's an extraordinary overview. But Rory Medcalf is uh, gamely going to stand up and try to make uh, sense. But Rory is at the Lowy Institute for International Policy, where he's a fellow. Also, he uh, is a member of the Australia Indi India Institute and a really very perceptive commentator, I think, on India here in Australia. So, ladies and gentlemen, pre please welcome Rory. Thank you, Geraldine, and uh, congratulations yet again to uh, Amitabh Mathu on this, uh, on, on this conference. Uh, it's uh, fascinating to see a debate that almost uh, at times sounds like the, um, as, as one friend and colleague said, the, the conscience of India uh, being played out uh, offshore here, here in Australia. I want to give you in the next few minutes um, 
one Australian's impressions of the, uh, the Indian media juggernaut, and I want to leave you with about half a dozen questions, really, that I'm barely going to attempt to answer that hopefully can drive our discussion or that we can take away uh, and think about as we watch uh, this, this mesmerising um, uh, beast, the Indian media, evolve uh, over the years, and many of us in Australia have already had an interesting uh, foretaste of, uh, of what that's like. Um, now, as, as Geraldine says, uh, I, I have worked as a diplomat and, and at the Lowy Institute, but uh, she may not know that I actually began my own working life as a trainee journalist um, in an Australian country town covering things like crime and politics, and they were often the same story once you started getting into it. Um, so that taught me from the very beginning that all politics is local and that um, a lot of very high-sounding ideology really masks uh, a lot of self-interest uh, power plays and vanity. So I certainly felt at home uh, when I started working in India. Um, and I certainly uh, got a very, uh, a very strong taste very quickly for the Indian media. It was a, a genuine pleasure for someone who believes in journalism as a vocation to see, uh, I guess, the Indian media scene at first, at first hand and to see the growth and, and dynamism in that scene. But I do think that sometimes we are at the risk uh, of being a bit mesmerised by uh, the Indian media as a, as a force for good. And I think it doesn't hurt to, um, uh, to ask a few questions about the net effect, the net political effect of all of the, um, uh, the really astounding data that we've, uh, we've seen presented to us, to us today. Um, look, I think uh, I'll, I'll sort of get to my punchline, Geraldine, in case I run out of time. Um, but I want to come back to those six questions. I think that um, it's politically, uh, rather than in terms of, I guess, the, the, the commerce of media, but, but politically, we still have to ask the question, is there a media revolution in India? And if so, what kind of revolution is it? Um, and I guess my argument would be that we're not seeing a direct, uh, a direct uh, straight line uh, cause and effect between the proliferation of media outlets, the, um, the growth of newspaper circulation, the growth of, of, of TV uh, news viewership and so on, and I guess a more responsive and, and, and rational politics in India. Uh, certainly uh, the media can often be part of the solution in India, but um, I, I'd still raise the question that there are times that it can be part of the, uh, the problem. The, the punchline, I guess, um, the one conclusion I want, I want to sort of raise is that despite the, uh, I guess, the pros and cons of, of the way the Indian media operates, there is what I think um, is a, a virtuous triangle evolving in the media scene in India, the way it impacts on, on governance and, and accountability and really, really getting the, uh, the truth out. And this, this triangle has three sides to it, and I think the so-called mainstream media is only one side of that triangle. I think a second side that we haven't heard so much about yet, although I pr appreciate there was some reference to it from my, uh, my, my previous colleague who spoke, is, is social media in India. Uh, social media as a tool for, I guess, citizen journalists or indeed social activists. And the third side of the triangle uh, is the interplay of the international media and the Indian media. I think we're living in an extraordinary time where the story a country tells itself is automatically observed by uh, a, a conversation internationally and reflected back into that country. And the gaps in that conversation are also reflected back into that country, at least if that country's not China. Um, so it's it's the interplay among these three, uh, these three kinds of media, the, the massive growth in the mainstream media, the rise in the last really five years or so of, of very dynamic social media in India, and the way uh, that international reporting on India is growing and being accessed in India that I think is actually having the biggest political effect. And we've had a taste of that in the past day or two, I think, the very fact that uh, this conversation here is being followed uh, and responded to in India is um, some testimony to that. Uh, and I think some of India's most avid tweeters are, are here in this very, this very room. Um, I guess my argument is that each of these three forces, mainstream media, social media, international media, can have uh, negative and distorting effects on their own uh, while also having some positive effects on politics. But when they play into one another, uh, for example, when we read uh, in the international press or indeed in the Indian press about uh, efforts to uh, censor or, or suppress certain Twitter handles uh, in India in the, in the last few months, um, if, if, I mean, I think even a particular story yesterday about a young gentleman, not so young gentleman, being arrested for a, uh, an injudiciously worded tweet about uh, the son of a, a very important uh, person in India. Um, 
it, it's those moments when I think we realise that, um, I guess, uh, censorship is really not going to have a, um, a future in India. And certainly if the foreign media neglects an Indian perspective, you can be sure that our friends in the Indian media will hold, will hold us to account uh, as well. So the six questions I want to, I want to leave you with um, about the, really the interplay of the Indian media revolution and, and politics. Uh, the first question, can we really generalise about the Indian media when there's such variety? And I think we've already begun to answer that. Um, certainly a strong warning against uh, generalising about any one entity, uh, the Indian media. We're looking at everything here from really venerable and respected uh, nationwide uh, newspapers, and I'm looking at Siddharth wherever he's sitting in the, uh, in the audience, but also uh, regional publications that, although they're, they're very widely read, uh, are very clearly aligned to specific political interests and players. We're looking at government broadcasters that are seeking to adapt to the new age to, on the other hand, racy tabloid TV established magazines with very clear corporate uh, backers and interests to really boutique uh, weeklies that can quite bravely break stories that the others don't touch and of course the whole gamut of, um, of social media. The second question, is it really a revolution or just a lot of growth? Um, I'm not going to recapitulate some of the astounding figures we've seen, uh, the, uh, the readerships of, uh, of newspapers and so forth, other than to say that, um, uh, that uh, you know, these are mind-boggling figures for, um, for an Australian audience. Uh, you know, for example, you know, seven and a half million readers for an English language paper like the Times of India, even two and a bit uh, for, uh, for the Hindu, which I think um, most countries would struggle to have that many serious English language newspaper readers, including in, um, in countries with an English language speaking uh, population of almost 100%. The vernacular press, 16 million for uh, you know, some of the, the Hindi language newspapers and so on. What's interesting, though, is that um, the rapid growth of, of social media in India, while the numbers are, are, are substantial, is still dwarfed by the growth uh, in the mainstream media. In other words, uh, the impact we're seeing from social media in India still has a hell of a long way to go uh, when you think that perhaps only... 1% of Indians uh, are currently uh, playing with Twitter, and as I said, you, you, you see a few of them in the room today. But that impact will, I think, grow really massively in the, um, in, in the years ahead. And if you want to get a sense of where that might go, think about China, where you have something like 300 million social media users uh, already. Thirdly, the third question, or the third, third set of questions I want to leave you with, when I talk about revolution, I'm really talking about a revolution in, in, in political impact. Um, are more people in India better informed today because they're consuming so much more of this media? Is this affecting the quality of governance, the, 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 the reasonableness of argument, if you like, to use the expression that was used at the opening of this, um, of this conference? It is hard to draw a straight line here, but I would say that the interplay of those three sides of the media, Indian mainstream media, social media and international media, is uh, steadily making, making progress uh, in, in, in that... Um, in that context, and it's interesting that it's it's kind of a, a hybrid effect. It's no one kind of media that's achieving these changes. But if you look at some of the, whether it's the corruption scandals or the the outcry over uh, the security response to the Mumbai attacks a few years ago, it's really a combination of popular protest, very old techniques, uh, social media campaigns, uh, the collection of data in ways that was really not possible even a few years ago, and traditional media, mainstream media if you can call 24-hour live TV traditional media, I guess, I guess you can these days, all interacting that, that, that's achieving something like uh, uh, momentum for, for change. And I should add, uh, and I, I you know, would be delighted if my colleagues on the panel would, would, would differ on this point, but it seems to me that it's often the mainstream media that's following, sometimes reluctantly, uh, social media when it comes to some of these, uh, these calls for change. Um, the fourth question I want to leave you with is what does this do to policy, not just politics but policy, uh, in particular areas like foreign policy where often what's in the national interest is, uh, is not always what is particularly popular. And here the record is not so good in my view. Uh, here in Australia we've learned the hard way uh, how the Indian media, when the race is on for the story at, at fever pitch, can really magnify and sensationalise a, a hot issue uh, like the welfare of Indian students uh, over here in Australia to the point where 
uh, rational policy debate becomes very difficult. It would have taken, I think, quite a brave Indian politician or indeed quite a brave Indian journalist uh, to prominently go against the grain in, say, 2009, when the view was that there was a racist crime wave here in Melbourne, even though many of us knew that was not the case. And looking at India's foreign relations more generally, with China, I think, and with Pakistan uh, in particular, the kind of diplomacy that India probably needs, the diplomacy of, of, of discretion and compromise and really creatively looking for solutions, um, is not well served by uh, the kind of, uh, of media competition that we see to really uh, get the facts out even before they are facts. Uh, for example, Chinese border violations that may or may not have happened. And I appreciate there's a tension between this and the, uh, I guess, the needs of good, uh, accountable democracy at home. And uh, again, I would be delighted to hear any, any um, sensible answers on that. The fifth and second last question I have is the question about uh, really corruption and governance, and we've heard a lot about that in the conference here over the past two days. And we like to think that the media is uh, invariably part of the solution. Uh, and, and, you know, I think we can all recall some pretty glorious episodes in India's media history where it was. But I do think we need to weigh that against uh, what appears to be the reluctance still uh, of parts of India's mainstream media to, to lead in prosecuting uh, corruption stories. And I recall a particular instance in late 2010 uh, when it seemed to take a lot of social media pressure and some pretty bold moves by a very small magazine in India uh, before the, uh, the so-called Radia Gate story became uh, headline news in India's mainstream, mainstream press. Um, and, of course, one of the arguments at the time is that uh, uh, one or two um, rather prominent members of the Indian Fourth Estate were um, accused of um, being, I guess, backroom players in, um, in, 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 in political uh, or corporate uh, conversations. Now, um, I'd be curious to know if um, we'd have a similar dynamic here, if, uh, if, if the media would sort of close ranks in the same way in this country, if that was the case. And finally... Uh, if there is a media revolution in India, is it really just a social media revolution? Well, I think my argument is that it's not. It's a combination of all of these factors, the three sides of the triangle. Social media, I think, is going to have a huge future in India, which is very hard to track. But I just um, close by observing that, as I mentioned in China, where there are 300 followers uh, or users of, um, of Weibo, the Chinese sort of Twitter equivalent, the fact that uh, that, is so, that particular medium is so heavily censored by the Chinese government on any particular day, there are words or expressions, characters that you simply cannot use, is probably having a deeper impact, uh, negative or, I guess, um, stirring sort of uh, impact, you know, arousing, you know, uh, I guess, arousing impact uh, in terms of dissent among the Chinese population than the, um, perhaps the, the 10 million or so Twitter users uh, in India. But um, as I said, I think the Indian social media scene has a long way to go and I, and I do think that that virtuous triangle I mentioned at the beginning is going to have inevitably a, a positive effect on democracy and governance in India. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thanks, Rory. Thank you, Rory, very much. And I'm just going to beg about 10 minutes indulgence, Amitabh. Is that OK? Because we did start late. Is that all right? Just so that we, and uh, to welcome Sunit uh, to uh, address us now, um, as I said, a trainer of, of the journalists to come, but a very well-known news and current affairs anchor on Indian national television uh, and a radio broadcaster for early for over 30 years on all India radio. So uh, I'll be very keen to hear how Sunit approaches this. Thank you, Sunit. Thank you very much indeed, and uh, I'd like to thank the Australia Indian uh, Council for the, the, the Australia Indian Institute for inviting me here at the last minute. I'm a last-minute addition. I just happen to be here for something else, actually, for a fellowship uh, by the City of Melbourne and the ISSI, and uh, I was invited. Uh, I don't want to add very much to what has been said, but maybe just share a few experiences with you because the people who've spoken before me are far more eminent and far more experienced than I am, and they've given you a very good perspective on the Indian media scene. Um, I just want to share some experiences about training journalists. We do have run the oldest institute in India, training journalists. We started in 1965, and we are still the leading institute in India and perhaps the largest in the terms of number of students that we take in. We train them in print, we train them in, um, in um, uh, broadcast journalism, which was added later. But all our courses are interdisciplinary. 
and there's a huge amount of social media content also now being added onto our courses. We are in the process of expanding to a full university from something similar to your TAFE system to a university level, and uh, the Act of Parliament has been drafted and is going through its various processes. Uh, it's going to cabinet hopefully soon, and uh, then to Parliament, and then we are going to upgrade ourselves to your university and have larger programs. You want to uh, go in particularly for uh, MA level programs, uh, master's programs, and then research, because there's a great dearth of media and communication research in India particularly. And I think that's something that we need to help and try and fill that void. Um, we, have, we are also expanding geographically. We were located only in New Delhi till the 90s. In 1993, we, we established another branch in eastern India in a place called Dhenkanal, which has taken root. But since I took over about three years ago, uh, we have now established four more branches. We have now a presence, at least a small presence uh, initially, in the five major regions of India, which is north, south, east, west, and the northeast. Um, and uh, this is going to grow and develop. The fact is, uh, I think in Nalin's presentation, you had that statement from Uday Shankar saying that nobody trains uh, reporters for, for television, and they, the, the television companies themselves don't have the money to invest in it, and they don't have the time to do it. We do try, but our experience has been that uh, in almost all respects, once they leave our portals, they have become slaves of their masters. And this whole ownership issue, wh where do the owners take the media, what kind of ethics are allowed to be practiced, what kind of practices, what kind of depth and analysis goes into their stories, it becomes an issue more of ownership and control rather than of the training that they have received as journalists. So that is a huge issue, and I think that really will get sorted out very, very slowly indeed. One of the points that I want to pick up on, which is very hopeful now, is this whole, which has just been mentioned, digitization, which is going on now. In fact, just as I was here um, two days ago, uh, in four cities in India, the analog signals were supposed to have been switched off, and they were supposed to have gone digital, and uh, in the next couple of years or so, we're supposed to go entirely digital. Now, the impact of this is going to be twofold, hopefully, and what the, the, the best outcomes that we are hoping from this is, number one, with digital addressable systems, this whole problem of TRPs that uh, Mr. Sarkar, I mean, he's launched a, he's lodged a case against uh, the rating agency, which uh, su uh, supplies us with television rating points. Hopefully, some of that will get sorted out. We'll actually get to know what the market wants and what the market is watching, which we don't at the moment. We have terribly unreliable figures and statistics, which then tend to skew the programming and the content. And uh, the fact is we have a huge amount of channels and a huge amount of uh, uh, media enterprises, but there is very little diversity in terms of content. And I want to share with you a small experience that I've had because the previous job I was in before this uh, was in television. I was uh, CEO, I helped to est establish and then I became the CEO of a very peculiar experiment that took place in India and it's still the only ex experiment of its nature I believe in the world, which led me to believe that niche programming can work and there is no space for niche programming in India right now. Uh, the parallel I want to draw is with the film industry, in which I also have some experience. We used to have large cinemas with 1,000 seat capacities and more. That was a time when films were made only for the lowest common denominator because you had to fill those cinemas to get your revenues back. The moment you started having the multiplex revolution where you had smaller cinemas with 100, 200 seats, the diversity of content started increasing because there was scope for some diversity, niche uh, uh, programming could be achieved. Now, this is not happening in television at the moment, but I think with the digital uh, revolution, once we switch to digital and people are able to gauge markets uh, more easily, uh, viewership patterns more easily, there will be niche programming, niche content being developed. And that is the only hope that I hold out at the moment. We did a very peculiar thing. Uh, we have, in India, as you know, parliamentary uh, democracy is uh, touted very widely, but nobody really follows parliament very much as to what actually goes on in parliament. And uh, for a long time, from the 90s onwards, only the sessions of parliament were televised by the national broadcaster, by Doordarshan. Um, but they were only, so people had only limited access to it, and only the sessions were, uh, were, were telecast. Um, 
the Speaker of the Indian Parliament at that time in 2005 decided that he wanted the, what the parliamentarians were doing to be seen more widely. He felt that this might have a salutary effect on the level of debate and uh, conduct within Parliament. Whether this actually happened is debatable. But he was told that you can only do this if you set up a 24-hour news channel which, for which space is made by television distributors. We've already talked about the problem of distribution in India. So we set about setting up a channel which was very low cost and which ran 24 hours a day and apart from the sittings of parliament, telecast debates, documentaries, discussions, all serious minded, some programming, uh, cultural programming as well, but heritage programming on classical or folk and so on. We didn't touch entertainment, we didn't touch sports. We evolved this program mix over a period of time. The most surprising thing was we ourselves did not expect this channel to be watched. We didn't expect that there would be any great figures emerging out of them. But within eight months of launching that channel, to my shock, I was at that time looking after the marketing and distribution, and I used to get the ratings figures such as they are in India, however unreliable they might be. To my shock, I discovered that we had actually attained the same nationally weighted average rating as all the English language channels in India without any marketing, without any advertising, because what we were doing was precisely the opposite of the noise that has been mentioned by Mr. Dua. Uh, the furious, uh, uh, Mr. Sarkar has also referred to it, the, uh, the kind of shouting matches that you have on media. We said we will have reasoned debate, balanced debate. Balance is very important. We operate under speaker's rules, so everybody gets their say. And we will have discussions. We had no news, no breaking news. Uh, you know, no Indian channel survives without breaking. They're breaking news 24 hours a day and uh, breaking the same news for seven hours a day often. Uh, no, none of this. And it worked. It works. It's still working. There are people watching it. Please look at the figures that are available. It, it gets as many viewers as any of the other channels. So there are myths about the media, which media marketing managers and uh, moguls and owners will not believe in, and they will not subscribe to, because they don't have reliable systems which they believe in to measure the audience. But I think there are niche markets there. The audience does want reasoned debate, does want a reasonable uh, level of informed discussion. And I think, I hope this will happen and come about, more of it will come about in the media with this digitization process. Thank you very much. Oh, well, I must say that was music to my ears. That was wonderful sort of, to hear that at the end of those amazing uh, statistics. And I thought that that notion of whether it was real diversity sort of picked up on something that, in effect, Rory was talking about. Now, look, I'm, I'm, being, I'm sort of stretching the friendship here, so I'm just going to allow for two questions because I, do, I know that some of the panel want to respond. So does anybody, are there sort of burning questions? Uh, I'm sure there were thousands, but that anybody would like to ask? Yes, please, sir. Can we just have a, a mic here? We've got it. Or just, yes, thank you. Yes, uh, Raj Kumar, Vice Chancellor General Global University. Sir, this is to Mr. Dua. Uh, one of the things about the current framework of regulating media is the fact that we have a press council of India which regulates broadly print media. We don't have a similar organization which can potentially regulate independently the broadcasting media. But whatever attempts to regulate media runs into this biggest risk of, in many ways, infringing the freedom of speech and expression and the possibility of media independently functioning. And whenever we talk about this, we struggle with the fact that how do we balance independence on the one hand and accountability on the other. Apparently that debate is on Indian television media under, is no, under no regulator. The print media is under press council watch which has not been given any teeth under the law. And I think Justice Cartier's demand for teeth to the press council is very valid. I'm not with the TV channels, private TV channels, the debate applies to, this question applies to them, <coughs> that they should not be under any regulation. Look at the kind of things that have been done unchecked. That in Guwahati, a girl was being molested in the central Chauka, Guwahati, and videotape is being made by a TV channel. 
where of the where was the regulator at that time? What punishment they have given to it? There are so many instances I can quote, but that will waste a lot of time, where regulation was necessary. Now, regulation is not necessarily to be the government regulation. Regulation is not necessarily to be controlled by Ministry of I and B. It has to be independent. And very f- large number of countries who believe in press freedom, they have some sort of regulation which is free of the government, but free of the private interests, since there is a question of ownership of them. Supposing a TV channel is not bothered about public interest, and TV channel is the proprietor, who is a business magnate, is making money on that. For making money, you violate the professional norms, use of the channel, or editorial content of the paper for selling a product. Already there's a controversy about the sponsored, the sponsored programs. Are they paid, paid news under, under a label called sponsored news, or is it really news? Now, they can sell their product. Now, it's a totally unprofessional conduct. Where to go? The regulator, where, which is selection made by the TV channels themselves, is not going to work for a long time. Even Britain, there's a complaints commission. You can't say that Britain doesn't believe in press freedom. America has complaints commissions. So many other various forms and names are different. Now, Murdoch had to appear before the House of Commons Committee. Now, the most powerful news baron of the world has been brought to, brought to knees by, by inquiry committee. He has got away thanks to uh, the Prime Minister Cameron. He's got away fairly. He could have been in jail for things they have done. So many TV channels in India are doing the same thing. They're attracting not only the violation of law, they're also attracting professional norms. Of course, professional norms, if you make a list, it will take one hour to describe more. I think there is a regulator, but it should be independent of the government, and it should be some representation by the media should be there, and constitution should be different from press council. Ideally, press council should be, become media council, and you can have two wings in that, one for the TV, one. But that's a question of structure. The principle of it, regulation is important, but independent of government, independent of the proprietors of the channels also. Thank you, Mr. Dua. That's fair. And, and uh, you want to add to that, Nalini? I just want to add one small footnote to what Mr. Dua just said about television and one substantial point. Uh, on television, there is self-regulation, which the government accepts. Look at their record. It, it works better in entertainment. 5,000 complaints in, a year, in the last year and a half, out of which they considered 700. They put details online of every decision they've taken and why. But look at news television, 780 complaints in, in a period of five years, out of which they've only announced decisions for 25 and only made decisions public for 25 of those. Others, we don't know. Uh, And even in those cases where decisions were taken, except for one or two cases, fines of one lakh rupee, and that's about it. Not even reported in their own annual reports. So there is an issue of transparency. And the most substantial point which I wanted to add to Mr. Dua's point, and that's a larger debate, uh, which he's alluded to, that press council has got no teeth. They had their own report on uh, on paid news, which they suppressed, but the owners didn't want it. But I think there is a larger issue that can you, that is the solution, and everybody wants an independent regulator, but... May, but there is an argument that in this case, the only thing that's worse than the current problem is the solution. That do you, can you really create an independent regulator in India? Um, uh, because that does that only mean getting an IS officer to get in, or who may or may not be independent? Uh, what is how many independent regulations uh, in, in institutions we have currently, except for those which are constitutionally mandated, like the Election Commission or the CAG and so on? And that's a real problem. We have the TRAI for television, which does not look at content but looks at all of uh, the technical issues of television. Uh, it's an open debate how independent the TRIA is. So self-regulation is not going to last for too long. Who selects a self-regulator? The TV channels themselves are selected. At the moment, we have a former Chief Justice of India. I have great respect for him, Chief Justice J.S. Verma. So you feel safe in his. Can you see all the channels? Does he have machinery to see all the channels? Will all the faults be reported to him? How many people know that there is self regulation And what punishment power he has? Nothing. Mm-hmm. Just a re- bit of reprimand. And reprimand by a civilized chief justice, frankly speaking, is not going to work. <laughs> despite my respect for... <laughs> despite my respect for J.S. Verma, he doesn't have the means to do it. He doesn't have the authority to do it. 
The law doesn't back him. Independent law should back. Self-revolution is something like Brahmacharya. Let me just... <laughs> Set as it is, please. Um, would one more, please. Is uh, just <clears throat> just behind, and then I'll we'll have to stop, unfortunately. Thank you. So my name is Shantanu, and my question is that uh, a lot of times, you know, we have the media who become uh, self-appointed. They take up self-appointed responsibilities to inform, advocate, entertain, and even be a watchdog at the same time. So is that a good thing, especially in relation to when we have, you know, we have an English media? Which, which caters to a particular class and community, and we have Hindi media and then Urdu media and local languages. So are these divides a good thing? And, uh, and is it good to give so much of uh, responsibility to media in terms when, you know, when the press council is literally, like, like you said, you know, tiger without teeth? You see, my problem, you, which I was hinting at, I didn't have time to you. elaborate it. <laughs> most TV channels, you are a TV expert, most TV channels are appealing to shining India. There is another India which is not being reported, not being informed, not their problems are not being listened to, their voices are not being listened, their problems are not being analyzed. They are not the audience for the, those, cha those channels at all. Most of the ads you will see, they are coming from shining India. So they have vested interest in covering the metros, the big cities, or big interests, which, which helps the channel to have uh, ads from that sector. And now they are becoming the owners also. M Mr. Dua, can I, can I just ask um, uh, uh, Jorhar to talk about... Because one of the most fascinating things I thought what you were saying is that actually without necessarily wanting to do this or even seeking to do it, that the, um, there'd been a unifying effect of... In, in, in the aftermath of independence, there'd been a unifying effect uh, uh, of the co collection of memory, corporate collective memory. And I thought that was very, very interesting. Would that be an answer to that young man's no, question? I guess what he's talking about is the screaming media taking over. Yeah. Uh, uh, is that it? Yeah, and also like when we have like, you know, that a lot of people think that Urdu media or Hindi media, they are especially meant to cater to certain audiences and not wider, even if they are national publications. So is that like, because they are given different responsibilities to different classes and communities, it seems. And it's only national English-speaking news channels or papers which have taken the onus that we will inform, advocate, and be the watchdog at the same time. I had referred to it about the main issues getting under the carpet. But then I have a solution for your problem, which many of us suffer from in India. You want to see views, look at them. You want to see news, look at us. <laughs> That's it. Very cute. All right. That's a lovely little, little uh, you know, bit of propaganda to end on. Um, <laughs> look, we really could go on, and I I'm just can feel Amitabh's <laughs> anxiety. Um, extraordinarily interesting, provocative, uh, open-ended, <laughs> um, challenging, and loads of, of things not settled. But really, I want to thank you gentlemen very much, Mr. Dua, Mr. Serka, Rory Medcalf, Nalin Mehta, and Sunit Tandon. Will you please thank, ladies and gentlemen, our great panel.